This is Novel Marketing, the show for novelists who aren't necessarily fond of marketing, but still want to become best-selling authors. Episode 119. I'm James L. Rubart, but please call me Jim. I'm Thomas Umstead Jr., and I have a cold. And I'm Kurt Isles. And in this episode, we're going to be uh, not talking as much as our guest, Kurt Isles, is going to be talking. And that's good for Thomas, because he's fighting off a New Year's uh, cold. And so, Thomas, we'll have your color, color commentary be more limited this episode, <laughs> if that works Sounds for like you. plan. Oh, Thomas, you sound so throaty and golden. I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, so in this episode, we're going to be talking, not theory like we usually do, we're going to be talking real world examples from an author, Kurt Isles, who has taken the Novel Marketing Podcast and used and implemented a lot of the ideas. And so we're excited to to talk to Kurt about that. I, I actually met Kurt, it's probably been 10 years ago that I first met Kurt. He came to a marketing seminar that I was putting on with my first agent. And, and we got to be friends that way and have stayed in touch over the years. And so Kurt, we're, we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Great to be with y'all. Yeah, and you can probably tell from Kurt's accent that he is from the South, and that's how he describes himself, as a Southern writer who's passionate about sharing the unique Piney Woods region of Western Louisiana. His books are, are set in that area. It's a really unique area. It's called No Man's Land, as well as Outlaw Strip, and as a writer, you can probably imagine that stories certainly can come out of that type of description. I, I love, Kurt, what you say about yourself. You stay, say three things. You always want to stay curious. You always want to be amazed. And you always want to share remarkable stories. And I think that, that those three things should go on the wall probably of every writer. So I appreciate that. Kurt, uh, you're married. You have a uh, wife, D, and you've got three sons. That's correct. And eight grandchildren. So yeah. you definitely have an extended uh, circle of family and friends. Yeah. So you can tell I'm not a 30-year-old writer either. <laughs> no, I'm 61. No. 61, okay. I'm 61 and proud to be here and have more book ideas than I'll ever write. You know, it's just great to be excited about writing at this season of my life. Well, Kurt, tell us a little bit about, just give us a quick background on, on, on your story. How'd you get into writing? And you have 13 books published at this point, and it sounds like you've got a lot more coming. Yeah. Um, I started out as a journal writer. I had an uncle give me a journal when I was a high school senior, and I'm on number 90 right now. But for probably 30 years, I just wrote my journal. I don't know if you all know my background is as a, a principal and coach. And, you know, just so many funny things and sad things happen at school. And I kind of would write for therapy, and I would write kind of funny stories and, and sad stories. And kind of, uh, I just kept People kept saying, you ought to make a book. You ought to write a book. So in 2000, I uh, used Wine Press. I bet you guys can remember when Wine Press existed. And yep, I yep. self-published my first book in 2000 and you know, had no idea uh, what would happen. I think I bought 1,000 copies. Back then, you had to buy you know, that many copies to make it forward. And it's still selling. Uh, the, one of the things I'm very excited about, and y'all's... Uh, podcast brings it out is keeping your books evergreen i'm very very fortunate that of course all 13 of my books are independent they're all evergreen uh, i sold more full sets of books during this holiday season i'm talking about the whole package of the 13 books together than i ever had so you do some bundling from time to time where you'll take all 13 books and, and bundle them discount them and sell them as a package nice good for you I have about four different bundles I do. I have a bundle of my first four books, which are short stories, and I have a cardboard set of them, you know, a box set. And then I take uh, my three of my novels together called the Westport series. But I was shocked, uh, guys, at how many of the full bundle, of the whole 13 books I sold over uh, the Christmas holidays. And, of course, I have a brand-new book out, As a Crow Flies. And what I found is a new book creates interest in the old books and um, I'm really excited to see this opportunity that my books can be evergreen there's no reason why even the original ones now what I'm doing right now I'm very excited about this I'm going back and repackaging all my earlier ones and by repackaging them I'm doing them through uh, create space 
and doing them large print as well. This was my first large print book as a crow flies, and I've really sold uh, a good, good number of large print books. So I'm going back on those earlier 12 books, each one of them I'm going to do in large print. And so there's a real market out there for that, as, as you well know. So when you say you're repackaging, are you doing new covers? Are you doing new back cover copy? Or is it really just going to that large print edition? Are you doing, you're doing the whole nine yards? Whole, whole new covers, new back script, uh, you know, doing the large print, doing an, another edit because, you know, hopefully I'm a much better writer than I was in 2000. And we've already done that on, we're doing it right now on the second book, but it will be new covers and everything. So it's really more of a second edition than a repackaging. Exactly. With, with mm-hmm. that edit. Now, what I've done on, on my covers, I guess on my last three covers, I've used 99 designs. I know y'all are familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Um, where basically graphic artists bid on doing your project. If I remember right, I think it's uh, $300 for your cover. And uh, the winner of my cover... Uh, for As a Crow Flies was a uh, artist in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, just when I saw what he did, I knew it was the winner. Uh, I mean, it was a great cover. Uh, he knew what to do with the font. And we used some, uh, I have an uncle who's a renowned landscape artist. And so I always have good background pictures. But anyway, uh, he designed the cover. And then, Jim, it was a great investment of working with you on the back cover. Uh, some of the readers may not know about what you do on back cover copy. Why don't you tell them about that? Oh, well, yeah, I, I, I write back cover copy for, for novels, and Kurt and I had a chance to work together on really a compelling story as the crow flies. And, yeah, we had a good time working on that together. Thanks for the, thanks for the shout-out, Kurt. Well, I'd rather write a 100,000-page book than write back copy. You know, it's, just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard to distill down what you've written. And, uh, Jim, I have really observed, I love going to bookstores and watching people look through your books. And I know you do this, too, Thomas, you also. They pick up your book, they look at the front cover, and, and if that catches them, they just flip the book over. And I really notice that when people start reading my back cover, I see their eyes light up. And, and what's kind of happened, As a Crow Flies, is historical fiction. As always, it's about this part of Louisiana. But it's really caught on as a YA book. Um, I just I watch these teenage girls when they turn the cover over and it says, My name is Missouri Cotton and I was born into a family of thieves. All I want in life is to escape, but I'm only 15 and I have no idea how. It just seems like girls, they, their eyes just light up and they say, i got to have this book. So, Jim... Uh, thanks for helping me uh, take the initial part of the book and, and put it in such a a winsome way on the back cover where people grab it. And then, of course, y'all know they flip through the book then. But it, I always feel like if we can get them to the inside, we're well on our way to making a sale. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. You're very welcome, Kurt. So what are the things that have you taken that come to top of mind that you've taken from the podcast and said, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do that. And, and the outcome of that. Well, I really want to go back before the podcast. Uh, Thomas helped me understand the importance of having a WordPress uh, podcast. And by that, having my own domain, my domain is creekbank.net. And back when a lot of people were doing other ways, you know, word blog and everything like that. Thomas uh, instilled up on me how important it was to have my own website. And basically what my website is, it has my blog on it. I've done now about 1,300 blog posts over probably 16 years. 1,300, that's, that's, that's sizable, good for you. Yeah, I, I do about two or three a week, I'm pretty consistent. I do a MailChimp uh, newsletter every Friday. Uh, once again, I learned about MailChimp from you guys. And what I do on Friday is I do the blog post. And then I also send it as a MailChimp uh, newsletter. 
because I found that many of the people are different who are subscribed to one or the other. But I've just been consistent. You know, uh, I've come to believe this in writing is it's just being consistent, blogging, you know, two, three times a week. Uh, but once again, uh, signing up for, you know, being on, um, you know, following y'all's guidelines, Thomas, before even knew Jim about WordPress. WordPress is the way to go. The plugins in my book table and all those things really helped me develop a professional uh, website. Now, my website guy that takes care of it actually lives in Uganda. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, I spent three years in Africa which was not a good career move for my writing career. But, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it, but it was a great experience. My wife and I were on missions in Uganda. And I got to work with a young man there that was just really a good graphic artist. And when I came back to America, we he's on retainer. I pay him every month. And he's making a good living for Uganda. And I have a partner that you know we really understand each other. And he does all the setup the uploads to uh, Amazon Create Space. Well, you bring up a good point, Kurt, that you mentioned it with 99designs, that suddenly for indie authors, the world opens up. You can work with people yeah. all over the world where 20 years ago it just was not common, maybe even 10 years ago it just wasn't being done to that extent. So good good for you. Wow. I want to ask you about beta readers because as an indie author, beta readers become incredibly important so mm -hmm. maybe start describing in your own words thomas and i have a definition of what beta readers are but maybe you could describe in your words what a beta beta reader is and what benefit they have brought to your novels mm -hmm. i look at what i do with creek bank stories as a concentric circles in other words my book is in the middle and we have all these concentric circles that reach out like a ripple of different people that help. Now I want to say this, the most important beta readers are the ones you pay. And I always have someone at the first I pay. I used a uh, fellow fiction writer in South Carolina. He did a very good job with a, a paid edit of the book. And then I have a guy in Dallas that always on probably my last 10 books gets the last look at my book. I've never met him. But he does real good work. His name is Paul Conant. And so those are, I don't know if you call those beta readers, you know, they're more uh, editors. But what really made this book was I had uh, three what I call beta readers. One was my oldest son. You may say, well, that's a family member, but he's a good writer. He knows my mind. He knows this area. And he was real honest with me about things in the in the book that, could be improved or left out. And then since this book is told from a woman, it's first person, Missouri Cotton's telling it, I needed a woman to read it. And there's a woods woman in the community I grew up in that just just tore this book up. In a, and when I say tore it up, in a great way. She just brought life to Missouri because it's not easy, a 61-year-old man writing about a 15-year-old girl. And then thirdly, my third, what I call beta reader, was a guy I grew up with I haven't seen since high school. He's an archaeologist, and he's a know-it-all, but he's a, a true know-it-all. He knows a lot about everything. And through track changes, I think he probably wrote 50,000 words in track changes and sent it to me. And when I took those three diverse opinions and put them together, that's when the book became a real book. So do you use different beta readers for different books or do you have some people you go to consistently? How do you how do you do that, Kurt? Pretty pretty consistently. Uh, okay. I use, hmm. Yeah, I will say uh, working with beta readers was my uh, very favorite part of the process of writing my book. So my book was nonfiction. Uh, so it was a little bit different, but I did it. I uh, started each chapter or started off as a Google Doc. And uh, I shared it with an initial group and that was the research team and then I expanded it to the beta readers. So I kind of had alpha readers and beta readers. And what was fun about using Google Docs was that uh, people could insert a comment and then other readers could respond to their comment. So 
somebody would say, oh, theologically, I don't think this is correct, or I don't think the science here is good. And other people would respond and be like, no, I disagree, or yes, I agree here, or here's another angle. And just discussing my book with my beta readers was so fun. <laughs> and it ended up in a much stronger book because not all of my beta readers necessarily agreed with everything that I had to say. And so I was able to work in criticisms and critiques to my arguments right into the first draft of the book <laughs> because the beta readers are like well what about this or what about this or i think you're wrong here and, and it ended up being very fun and it resulted in a much stronger manuscript at, at the end of it what about you jim how many beta readers do you use how many are enough and how many are too many for me i i used to have more now i have three beta readers that i'll send the um the stories out to and i want you to answer this question as well, Kurt, but it, the question I ask myself is, are these people I can trust to be honest? One of them is my son who has turned into a voracious reader and he and I have a r great relationship. We can be very open with each other about a number of things. But so when I come to a book and I give it to him, I know he's not going to say, well, I want dad to feel good. So I'm going to tell him I like the book. He has no problem going, dad, this does not work. So um, yeah, that's a key component is finding people who you know are uh, our readers first of all but second of all we'll be be honest with their responses all three of mine were very very open oh and one of the guys the archaeologist he was hypercritical but there's nothing wrong with getting a lot of criticism uh, i've always told anyone that reads my stuff as a, a better reader we'll make agreement i won't be offended whatever you tell me to do if you won't be offended if I ignore it. So, you know, I, I didn't take every change this guy had, but it was just invaluable because he was brave enough to be honest with me on places where the book could be and should be better. And you know what? When I'd see that, I knew it was right. Subconsciously, I knew it was right. I just need to hear it from another voice. And the same thing with my son and then my female friend. They, they all know me. They know my writing style. They're not afraid. They know that I'm not going to go off on a tangent when they make a suggestion. And I just, I just don't see how people write books without having that type of help. Because it's not just about the criticism. It's also about them saying, I really like this part. Right. Um, which that keeps so you from cutting it. You know, there was parts of my book I was like, oh, I don't know if I should keep this. And somebody's like, oh, I really like this. And so it ended up protecting the good writing. So it's not just about removing the bad writing. It's about protecting the good writing. And that is good. And I think it's important to have beta readers who will do both. Uh, you know, we've all been in a reading gr a critique groups that were toxic where some people, all they could say was something negative. But a good editor will tell you what sings and what doesn't. And when they say, oh, this, this, this is good, you know, you know then that needs to be in the book. Kurt, what would you say to somebody that says, yeah, I know I, I really haven't had beta readers. I've had a few friends, but not somebody that's real serious about it. How would you tell them to go about finding solid, strong beta readers? Well, of course, I had the advantage of written th 13 books. I've developed, you know, a regional reading, uh, you know, people who follow my stuff. And I know who are serious about, I, I'm not, a lot of people volunteer to take it and read it. I know you guys have run into it, and you never hear back from them. So one of the things you always have to do, I remember hearing this on one of y'all's podcasts, is you give them a deadline. I've got to have this back by this date. And if you can't do it during this time frame, I'll pass on this one. We'll catch you on the next one. So the key is having someone who's willing to put in the time and the effort to do it. And uh, these three were willing to do it. Yeah, what I did was I created a Google form with a bunch of questions that was like the application to become a beta reader. And then I posted it on my blog. I think I may have sent it out to my email list. And then people, strangers, applied uh, to be on my research team and to be on my beta reader team. And so some of these folks ended up becoming some of my very best friends. And my book was about dating and relationships, and almost all of them were single when they signed up to be on the research team and on the beta reading team. And now almost all of them are married. <laughs> so, like, the book works. <laughs> and so it's very fun uh, to see that process. But I didn't accept everybody. So not all of the applications got an invitation to be um, 
on the team and not every and I, what I ended up doing is the folks who gave me the best feedback on the research team became the beta readers and the alpha readers so right. I had a, a, what I did is I kind of had a small group that I trusted and then that group got bigger and bigger as I felt more confident about each chapter would you send it to a chapter by chapter Thomas that's how I did it for nonfiction because each chapter stood on its own. Uh, for fiction, it would make sense uh, to send them the entire book uh, and then have a deadline to have them get it back to you. Uh, Google Docs is a little um, hit and miss if uh, something's too long, so you may not be able to use Google Docs if you have a 100,000-word book. It may break Google Docs. Uh, so in that case, you may have to use Word uh, instead, which is harder if you're getting lots of feedback. I want to ask you guys, are you seeing more writers using Google Docs as opposed to Word? I think it's a generational thing. Um, in my experience, uh, older folks are really uh, unlikely to use Google Docs, whereas anybody who went to college after Google Docs came out most likely prefers Google Docs. So uh, like for, I'm, I'm like the very oldest person who had Google Docs in college, and uh, so I have a bias towards Google Docs. There's nothing wrong with Word, and, and Word is better um, for like editorial track changes. If you, uh, but it's the problem is is that it's if you have 20 beta readers, you have 20 different Word documents that come back to you, and you have to merge them, and it can be a bit of a mess. Whereas that does take time to do that. Um, right. Uh, it sounds to me that Google Docs is going to replace Word the way Word replaced Word Perfect. You know, I started on Word Perfect. And, you know, it was, I know some people just some people just would not hardly let Word Perfect go, and Word was so much better. But I was very interested about on Google Docs. Now, let me ask you a question on Amazon uh, Create Space: Can you upload a document as a Google Doc as opposed to just a uh, Word document? So you can output a document from Google Docs as a Word document. So you can bring in Word documents and send out Word documents. But I wouldn't put anything on CreateSpace that I hadn't put through a uh, typesetting um, program like InDesign or, or Vellum. Uh, so it yeah, it, what you're creating is not a print-ready document. And that's really the, where Google Docs is better, is that by abandoning printability as a goal, it gains a lot of other features uh, that make it uh, much more useful. Hey, Kurt. Um Shifting gears on you, we're 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 getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted to talk real quickly about Kickstarter. You used Kickstarter. You mm -hmm. took some of the things that Thomas, uh, who actually is an expert on Kickstarter and crowdfunding in general, has a course on it. If we haven't mentioned that in a while, um, which is real worthwhile. Tell us a little bit about your Kickstarter experience. Yeah, uh, Thomas, uh, you and Mary, I took Cal's course. I also got some books and read, but the course was the key that showed me how to set up my Kickstarter campaign for As a Crow Flies. Uh, I had a modest goal of $4,000, but uh, uh, and I surpassed it, and uh, it created a lot of momentum for the book. I was very excited about that. I had this good story. Uh, one of my, uh, the, the highest thing was that for $1,000, you could have a character named after you. And I thought no one would do that. Well, one of my friends that's a doctor who grew up in our little hick town, he wanted, he wanted his daddy's name in the next book. So he paid $1,000. And the next day I had an email from some people I know in California. He said, oh, I wish we'd known about the contest. We would have... We would have got our name. I said, oh, we can have two names. <laughs> so another couple paid, another family paid another $1,000. So, wow, nice. I mean, nearly half of my uh, Kickstarter came from that. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to do Kickstarter on the next one. I'll tell you why. It did create great momentum. But the people who pre-bought the books for $10, basically what I had was you could buy the book, which would normally be 15 plus $5 shipping, I was selling it to them for $10 with no shipping. You cannot add shipping to Kickstarter. So basically, uh, I was by the time I got through, I'd sold people who'd normally buy my $15 book plus $5 shipping. I was selling them the book for $10, and my printing cost and my shipping cost, I was losing money to those customers now it did create some momentum but 
it being my 13th book, I don't think that, uh, I think, I think I lost a good bit of money on sales through that right there. Any comments you have on that? Yeah, what what I'd recommend if you did it again is the ten dollar level is only the ebook, and that's what I've done with all of our campaigns. And that way, um, you get to keep all ten dollars. <laughs> so uh, I've I've never done a Kickstarter where you get anything shipped to you for any less than twenty bucks because uh, you got to have that margin in there. You got to have the cost for the printing. Right, and and that was my mistake. Now, of course, it was a great momentum builder. And uh, another thing I had that we was getting ready to have it, I had what I'm calling a Dry Creek Weekend. And that's where I'm from and where most of my stories are written. And we have a, a multitude of couples who've paid to come stay in this bed and breakfast in our little community. And I'm going to take them to all the sites of my stories and we're going to cook out and have a hay ride. And we're just going to show them a good weekend uh, telling stories from my books and I mean I'm looking forward to that and that was I think two hundred dollars a person and it was neat the creative things you can do with a Kickstarter campaign but the main thing I did I did my homework uh, and y'all's course you and Mary's course Thomas uh, make sure people know how to get a hold of that it was the key to having a successful uh, you know campaign well, thank you for that plug. We'll have a, a link to the course in the show notes, <laughs> novelmarketing.com slash 119. Uh, you can get a link uh, to that course. We walk you through step-by-step step how to uh, fund your book on crowdfunding. If you're wanting to self-publish and you don't have yeah. the money, you can raise the money from your readers on sites like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And let me just add a word to that. Is that in the age we're in now, it, there's no reason why if a person has a good book, they cannot publish it through Create Space or Spark, you know, Ingram Spark. And you only have to buy, you can buy five copies if you want to. You don't have to. When I first started independent books, you know, you, you had to buy 500 or 1,000 to make it worth it. Well, now you can buy five books. And then what I love is you can make your corrections. Uh, and, you know, you try to produce that book that has no mistakes. But I I have a deal in the front of my book encouraging my readers to email me. I have my personal email if any mistakes they find, and they will send it to you. Whereas if a book mm-hmm. is printed 250,000 copies with a mistake, it's pretty hard to correct that. So I've, um, I'm on my pro- probably, I guess i call fourth edition of As a Crow Flies. We've made four little corrections. And I just feel much better about having a book that's closer to perfection as far as grammatically and formatted wise. So that's another advantage. I'm real high on Amazon Create Space. Yeah, and, and, one, and one more thing uh, for those of you listening, you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me. You know, he's writing this Southern fiction, it's really focused on this. You know, Southern culture, and it's like, well, actually, that's the secret to his success. By focusing very narrowly, uh, he's able to thrill an audience where people are willing to pay two hundred fifty dollars to go to an event or a thousand dollars to get their name in a book. And instead of trying to target everyone, there's a lot to be said about finding right. a psychographic or a demographic group that's underserved. And you know, there's a big media bias against Southern accents. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't hear them much uh, in a positive way on television, and um, so, in general, you know that community is an underserved market, and if you are able to see, oh, that's a market opportunity, that's a business opportunity. There can be gold in them thar hills. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm doing this book as an audible book, but because it's told by a female, I'll be going through ACX, you know, uh, which is Audible's uh, company, because it needs to be read by a female, but. Once again, that's uh, on one of y'all's podcasts. Y'all talked about why your book should be audio books. So once again, another plug for author marketing. <laughs> there you go. Thank, thank you. We appreciate that. Anything else, Kurt, that we haven't covered that you think you want to say, hey, guys, if you're at this point in the journey, think about doing X. Any other thoughts before we sign yeah. off? Well, one thing I'm doing and- – I'm going back and make an audible of all my earlier books and I can do, you know, I have a good setup here in this studio where I'm at today. I mean, you can tell it's a good audio setup and I, 
I'm doing Audible on all of my earlier books because people have requested it. And that's one more way to keep my books evergreen. Now, I'm writing new books. My goal this year is to write one physical book and two ebooks. And I'm excited about that. But I'm also, I've really come to realize that you can keep your books evergreen by just adding bells and whistles and be willing to look at new ways to market your books. And um, once again, I'm a regional author. I may never be anything beyond that, but I love writing about the part of Louisiana I love. That is, it's not the cotton country. It's not Cajun country. It sure as heck is not New Orleans. It's the Piney Woods, and it's different, but it's what I know. It's what I write about, and people enjoy hearing about that. It may not uh, fly in New York City, but it sure flies in western Louisiana, and uh, I just really feel feel fulfilled in doing it. Well, congratulations, Kurt, on on your success and your longevity and your uh, and your desire to bring people into captivating stories. Wow. Um, one of the things I love about on your bio page on your website is you say. You love Anthony DeMello's, DeMello's quote, the shortest distance between the truth and a human heart is always a story. And you're telling stories that definitely go deep into the human heart. So thank you so much for uh, uh, for being with us. I mean, we're storytellers, guys. That's what we all are. And whatever medium that storytelling takes place. And that's why I will always keep blogging also, because a blog post is a story. It's just a short story. Mm, that's good. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, we we need to tell our stories. Indeed. The sponsor of today's episode is the five-year plan to overnight success as a best-selling award-winning author. This is the course that Thomas and I have put together um, that can help you <laughs> get to that overnight success in five years. And, and the reason we joke about that is uh, a lot of people will give you shortcuts. The shortcuts rarely, if ever, work. This is a plan that we've guaranteed will make you a best-selling award-winning author. If it doesn't happen for you, yes, you do get your money back. And um, if you get 30 days into it and say, you know what, this was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. I want my money back now. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee and a five-year money-back guarantee. Thomas, any other thoughts on the course? Yeah, it's just step by step. Uh, if you want to know what to do next in your career, if you're stuck, uh, this has got a roadmap for you, a five-year plan, and we've gotten really great feedback from the people who are using it. And uh, I think a lot of folks who are signing up now are doing it through recommendations of, of people who are already our students. Uh, the price is going to go up on January 31st. We do have a date finally on the price rise. So if you want to get in before the price goes up, uh, go to novelmarketing.com and click on the link for five-year plan. You've been listening to James L. Rubart, Thomas Umstead Jr., and Kurt Isles on the Novel Marketing Podcast, giving you novel ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing, offline, online, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening.